So there are a number of drugs, both over-the-counter and prescription, that can result in bone loss that may lead to osteoporosis. Today, I want to talk about one controversial one. This drug is used by tens of millions of people every year and holds a $10 billion market in the United States alone and is forecasted to continue to increase. So stick around because many, many people use this drug and don't know that it's not meant for long-term use. Most people do not need to use this drug long-term and if you ask your doctor about it, they probably don't know what I'm about to present to you. So stick around. So what is this crazy drug I'm talking about? I'm talking about proton pump inhibitors. Proton pump inhibitors go by names like Nexium, Prilosec, Prevacid, Protonix, uh, the generics are esomeprazole, omeprazole, lansaprazole, pantaprazole, um, and so on. There's a, a ton of them on the market. These drugs have become so common that they seem to be very safe. Their use and frequency is up there with drugs like ibuprofen and Tylenol. And it seems that you can just take these whenever you want because there are no issues because they're over the counter and they're totally safe. Me, If you do a quick Google search and try to figure out how many deaths are attributed to ibuprofen and Tylenol, you'll find that there are thousands of deaths every year as a result of these over-the-counter drugs. So over-the-counter drugs must be taken with caution and supplements too. We've already talked about calcium and increased risk of heart attack and stroke. Like a lot of drugs that are over-the-counter, they started out as prescription only. There was so much concern at the time because they were so powerful and the impact of blocking all the stomach acid was of great concern to the people that were creating it that they would not allow this to be sold over-the-counter. Well, in 2003, that changed. So in 2003, the first PPI began to be sold over the counter as Prilosec. And from there, you know, every drug company just wanted their product out there, product out there. So now there are a ton of PPIs sold over the counter. So how do these things work? Well, these drugs, as you might assume based on their name, block proton pumps. Proton pumps in the stomach cause a release of hydrochloric acid. And when hydrochloric acid is blocked, there is a massive lowering of the pH in the stomach. So for those that take this for symptoms of too much acid in their stomach, we'll talk about what that means, but the question is at what cost? So we'll talk about the cost in a second, but I want to talk about this because remember that when you've, when you've told that you have too much acid or that you feel like you have too much acid because you, your chest is exploding because you have so much acid in your stomach, it's not actually a too much acid problem. In fact, generally, feelings of acid reflux are a gut dysfunction problem, meaning that there's backup in your gut, you don't have good motility, uh, there's something happening, you have some, um, some intestinal overgrowth um, of bacteria, you're producing gas in a bad way, up high in your, in your gut. Um, whatever it is, it can cause contents to be pushed up into your esophagus and it's going to give you symptoms of reflux. It's not because you have too much acid, it's just in the wrong place. There are also other reasons why you might have acid pushed up into your esophagus. That acid um, could be pushed through what's called a hiatal hernia or a defect um, in the area around the stomach in that junction of the, uh, the sphincter. There could also be issues with that sphincter or um, the area that uh, kind of the valve that keeps food um, and acid on the correct side of the esophagus. So if that valve isn't working, that's another reason why acid can be pushed up into the stomach. But for the most part, the gut dysfunction can be resolved and sometimes, not always, but sometimes the mechanical things can be resolved as well. So you can resolve the hiatal hernias, the lower um, esophageal sphincter dysfunction, sometimes surgically, depending on a lot of variables. But what's really important to understand here is that it's not a too much acid problem. It is an acid in the wrong place problem. So the answer then seems to be, well, let's just squash the acid and we're done. And that makes sense if we didn't need acid. But why would we have acid in our stomach, especially at such a strong strength uh, with a pH of almost one as a very, very acidic environment? Why would your body tolerate that? Why would we continue to do that if we didn't need it? Well, it turns out we do need it. We need acid to break down protein. We need acid to absorb critical nutrients. If you're a bone health person, you might remember that we need to absorb calcium. We need to be able to absorb iron when appropriate. Magnesium, B12, all of the B vitamins, they all take stomach acid. So if you're dropping your stomach acid, and I should say actually raising your pH, but if you're lowering your stomach acid 
you're not going to be able to absorb these things and there has to be downstream dysfunction as a result of this. So there are implications to this. So some of the things that happens, and this is really, really interesting physiology, which may not be that exciting to most people, but I'm kind of a nerd with this stuff. When you block hydrochloric acid and your pH goes up, the impact locally in the environment is that other cells start to react differently. So there's a very delicate feedback mechanism of hydrochloric acid and other things. So there are other enzymes like gastrin, which are secreted by other cells in your stomach called parietal cells. And when you don't have hydrochloric acid, your parietal cells start to increase gastrin because gastrin tells the other cells in the stomach to make hydrochloric acid. So this is the feedback loop, right? So if you block one, you're going to see more of the other. And in fact, you can actually get this thing called hypergastrinemia. Um, you can also get hyperplasia or uh, a growth of the mucosa itself. You can create polyps inside the stomach as a result of not having any acid because, again, these cells are trying to compensate for not having any acid. When I looked up the consequence of these things, I found a study that said that, don't worry, these polyps are usually benign and rarely lead to cancer. Okay. So it rarely leads to cancer. That's good to know. Um, there's also these other things called enterochromaffin cells, and these cells make histamine. So I've noticed as I've been listening to uh, providers that have been in the functional space for decades, there's this massive increase in things like mast cell activation syndrome or um, uh, histamine-related issues. And just dawned on me recently that perhaps this might play a role in that. Um, don't know if that's associated, but it seems like if we have millions of people taking these things and we're seeing a lot of increase in these things that are histamine related, that possibly they could be related. I don't know, uh, but certainly it could cause some immune dysfunction um, that actually increases your risk for infection. So that's not cool. You might be thinking at this point, oh my gosh, I got to stop my PPI. Well, you should stop your PPI, but you need to understand why you're on it first. And you also need to understand that if you stop a PPI, there is this rebound effect that occurs. Once you stop PPI, your body has been pushing to make more stomach acid. So once you stop your PPI, guess what? You're going to be successful. You're going to make more stomach acid and you're going to be symptomatic. So we have to do this carefully. And I'm going to talk about how we do it in our practice. And if anybody is considering stopping it, you have to talk to your doctor because you need to understand why you're on it in the first place. You have to understand, uh, do you have a mechanical defect? Do you have uh, something called Barrett's esophagus or a risk of cancer of your esophagus. So these are really, really important things. All right. So let's talk about the impact of this PPI consumption on bones. You might hear that it's debatable. I'm here to tell you that it's not really debatable. It's actually really clear. This is my take. PPIs lead to increased fracture risk, period. But your doctor may tell you otherwise. So let me explain why. Before we get to that, if you haven't already, do me a big favor and click that subscribe button down below. This helps us to reach more people that are looking to improve their bone health. And if you haven't read our free book yet, you can download the PDF of this book through the link in the description below, or you can pick it up on Amazon. It's a quick read. It's a basically a reboot and a rethink of how we should be managing osteoporosis. And if you want to hear me put all this together in one place, join our free masterclass where we put it all together in one place and help you to understand all the things that you could potentially do on your own versus what you might need to find a team for. All right, so let's get going. Why might your doctor tell you that PPI exposure is not associated with lowered bone mineral density or fracture risk? Well, there are studies to support that view. And as you can imagine, these studies are going to be promoted to physicians uh, by the drug companies, I would assume. I can't say that that actually happens. But there's a study from 2010 that I pulled. <clears throat> so this study um, was actually quite large. And this is one of the, the convincing parts about the study. There were 3,500 people in a cross-sectional study, meaning they just looked at it at one time and 2,500 participants in a longitudinal study. I mean, they followed them over time. And their conclusion was that there's no association with PPI use and changes in bone mineral density. There was one thing that I noticed on this, and that's that one of the authors did serve on the board of multiple pharmacy companies. So perhaps there's a small conflict of interest. doesn't mean it's not true. It just means we need to consider that there is a potential conflict of interest here. So what other studies do we have? Well, there's some newer studies. So 2016, um, a controlled study that's 12 months long with 209 people. So this is obviously a much smaller study. But in this study, there was a statistically significant reduction in bone mineral density in the treatment group compared to the control group. I have another study here, another 2016 study of 80 people. This had two years of exposure. And they also demonstrated an increased likelihood of progression to osteoporosis 
rather than control. So they weren't looking at BMD. They just wanted to know, oh, that's not true. So I've got another study here from 2016 with 80 people in it, and they had two years of exposure, and they showed an increased likelihood of progression to osteoporosis than controls. So who's right? Do we follow the study that had more numbers and a little bit of bias maybe? Or do we look at the smaller studies and say, well, they're small, but they seemed like they were accurate. How do we know? Well, the truth is we don't know. But honestly, it doesn't matter. Because remember, we're not so much interested in bone mineral density as we are fracture risk. So if there are studies that show fracture risk differences, I'm going to go with those studies. And we do have those studies. So we found a 2016 meta-analysis. So this is a study of studies, right? So this was a study of 18 studies, 250,000 cases. And there was an increased risk of fracture with exposure to PPI. 26 to 58% increase depending on the site. And this was true for both less than one year and over one year of use. So that's pretty convincing. There's another study from 2006 of 150,000 cases in controls, and they showed a 44% increased risk of hip fracture, specifically with long-term exposure. Found another study from 2000 looking at PPIs and H2 blockers. Now, this was not a huge study, but what I like about the study is that it actually compares the two. So this is a really important point. PPIs are one class of drug. I already mentioned all, well, some of the names. H2 blockers are a different type of drug. So H2 blockers go by the name Zantac, Pepsid, Tagamet. They both work to reduce stomach acid, but H2 blockers are not as strong and do not last as long. So you could argue that they're not as effective. But I think the question is, how effective do we want them to be? If you need a little bit of help with stomach acid, an H2 blocker might actually be okay. Because what this study showed is that PPIs lead to increased fracture risk, but H2 blockers do not. All right, so what do we do? Well, <clears throat> first of all, we need to understand, again, that GERD or acid reflux is not an acid problem. It is a location problem. It is generally coming from gut dysfunction or an anatomical issue, and both of those may be able to be fixed. Gut dysfunction can take time, and you have to be working with the right person. But our experience is that generally we can get people off of PPIs if that's the reason why they have them in the first place. So that would be number one, is to Talk with your team, find a provider that can help you and get off of PPIs if you can. Please talk to your provider, understand if you have Barrett's esophagus or if you're at risk for cancer or any other reason why you need to be on a PPI because there is a time and a place. Second, if you need a little coverage for some stomach acid being pushed into your esophagus, whether this is from a sphincter dysfunction or whatever, try an H2 blocker instead of a PPI. This is what we're doing for our patients because there is so much less risk Again, they're not as strong. They don't work for as long. But this is something that we're using for our patients and we find it to be effective for those that still need some kind of coverage. And lastly, we want to create a comprehensive plan because this is just one piece of the puzzle. You never want to just latch onto one thing and say like, oh, I found it. This is why I have osteoporosis. I fixed that thing. I'm good. That's not it. It's more complex than that. We really need to do more. We need to have a comprehensive plan that hits all of the things in the framework that I talk about ad nauseum. So I won't talk about it here. So that's it on PPIs. I hope that all makes sense and that it wasn't too overwhelming with the studies, but I hope that points out that PPIs do increase fracture risk and they do lower bone mineral density, most likely, but ultimately I'm more interested in the fracture risk. If you want to join a tribe of people that are looking and trying to find these same answers as you, because if you got to the end of this video, you are in this group, consider joining our HealthSpan Nation. HealthSpan Nation is something I created so that I can connect with people outside of our practice. Our patients are actually going to be in the HealthSpan Nation as well, but this is an opportunity where we can get together, ask questions, have a topic-driven Q&A once a week, live. It's recorded. If you miss it, you can follow it. This is also where we're going to store all of our uh, discount codes for our affiliations and uh, companies and products that we've vetted. Uh, this is also where we're going to have the opportunity for you guys to connect with each other on a group platform if you choose to do so. So super excited about HealthSpan Nation. If you want to join that, head over to drdouglucas.com. You can check it out over there. Thanks for watching.